Welcome back to another video for AP Psychology. This is lesson number seven, which is looking at communication in the nervous system. And so with this lesson, we are now beginning uh, the second unit of the course. Uh, the biology unit is quite heavy in vocabulary, so it is going to be important to come back to these videos or uh, the vocabulary to study. The more you look at this stuff, uh, the better it's going to be for you in the end by the time the AP exam rolls around or just for uh, getting this vocab starting to become ingrained into your mind. And so what we're going to do in this unit is start off very small. Today we're going to look specifically at the uh, neuron and structure of the nervous system, specifically how your neurons are going to communicate to pass messages so that your body can do stuff or react to things or uh, a million other things that are going to go on. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the basic hardware of the neuron. And basically what I've tried to do here is give you some really brief one word almost definitions of what some of these components are. Alright, so basically the first thing we're going to start off with is the basic hardware to the neuron. And so first, as part of the neuron, we have the soma, which is the cell body. You have the dendrites, which are going to be all concentrated around the cell body, and these act as the receivers. And what they do is basically listen for communication from other neurons. Uh, you have an axon. The axon is um, a structure that is primarily used to transmit information from one neuron to another. And so the axon will eventually branch off into its own system of terminal branches, which is just another collection of axons, and they will try to eventually communicate with another neuron's dendrite. Along the axon, it is uh, sometimes found you have something called myelin sheath. And the myelin sheath is basically a fatty substance that will coat the axon the same way that a piece of plastic might coat a wire. And so the, um, the purpose of the myelin sheath is basically to insulate the axon. When it does this, it is actually going to help speed up information processing and is going to allow for basically uh, faster communication. Now, the myelin sheath builds up um, until around age 25. And at that point, then it will start to degenerate. And so if you have a complete destruction of the myelin sheath, what this can result in is a number of things. One of those things would be a loss of communication from your brain, basically, to your body's muscles. And so you may develop MS or multiple sclerosis. If this happens, then you basically may lose the ability to control your uh, motor functions, your muscles. Another thing that could also happen is that if you have a reduction in myelin sheath or a complete uh, elimination of your myelin sheath, then what you might find is some uh, cognitive processing issues. And so it's been linked with things like dementia and forms of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, because you're now having a harder time buffering or processing information, you're lacking that basically insulation to help speed up the processing, it is uh, resulting in some cognitive deficits. Uh, let's go back to the structure of the neuron though. So next you have terminal buttons and these are basically the storage unit for neurotransmitters. Now later I'll actually tell you that while the terminal buttons are the storage unit for neurotransmitters there's actually something within the terminal button that will separate and hold the different chemical messages. So we'll get to that soon. But uh, the chemical message that is being stored is called a neurotransmitter, which you can now probably decipher on your own. And so your body has numerous types of different neurotransmitters that can be released. There are some major ones that will feature in another video, but uh, that's what a neurotransmitter is. It's a chemical message that is being sent. So next is going to be uh, the synapse. And the synapse is basically the junction point. So this is going to be the place where two neurons will communicate where they almost basically meet. So you'll see on another diagram it will show you a couple of neurons and while it may appear that they look like they're touching they are actually separated by a very 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 small gap and so uh, the synapse is going to be the junction point though, where messages will transfer from one neuron which is called the presynaptic, uh, presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron. And then lastly, also what you have around the neurons is glial cells. And the glial cells are basically the things that hold everything together. So they're often referred to as the janitor of the neuron. And they help remove waste. They hold things in place. 
So just taking a look here, here's a larger picture of the neuron. And so what you can basically see is the cell body. And inside of that, there is a nucleus. And so it basically looks like a, a gumball. And then all around that nucleus is the cell body. Branching off of that cell body are the dendrites. Those are receiving your information. Information passes along the axon, and that's coded by the white fatty substance, the myelin sheath. And then it eventually extends into a series of terminal branches. And on the ends of those are your terminal buttons, which are going to be filled with neurotransmitters or chemical messages to be released. Now, uh, what I'm going to go over next is basically how the neuron works by itself. So inside of that axon, you have a bunch of fluid filled with ions, and it is uh, filled with negatively charged ions. And so this creates a stable state. It's called the resting potential. And what's going to have to happen for any chemical messages to be transmitted and passed around is you're going to have to have the axon experience the depolarization. This means that briefly that resting potential will switch into a less negative or even a positive charge and this will cause a action potential. The action potential is what's needed to help pass along uh, this impulse to release neurotransmitters or chemicals. And so the way that basically works is that the axon has almost like guardians or chambers that are blocked off and so Outside of the axon, there are positively charged sodium ions that are trying to get inside. And when some of those gates get opened, the positive ions flood in and they create a less negative charge or sometimes even a positive charge. And this is going to trickle down more and more and open up more of the gates and it's going to cause an action potential. That's the shift in the charge. By the time it gets to the end of those chambers, sometimes you can even have the initial ions at the beginning, they have already recharged. So if there's any time delay here that is occurring, that minimum downtime is referred to the absolute refractory period. Now in my class what I like to say is think about a series of dominoes lined up. If you knock over a set of dominoes and they all get knocked over, then you can't really knock them over again. Now obviously you can, but you have to set them back up. So that's going to take some time. Think of that as your downtime and that basically is the absolute refractory period. It's the minimum downtime before there can be another action potential. There's also another refractory period. This is called the relative refractory period. And with this one, uh, instead of there requiring necessarily a downtime, now the threshold to fire has been raised. So there has to be more of a positive charge. And so uh, the final part of the neuron working alone is the all or none law. And basically this is kind of like the dominoes. Basically either you have an action potential that is created or it doesn't happen. So either your neuron fires that action potential or the charge is never big enough to build up an action potential in the first place. Here's a diagram basically of the depolarization process. Uh, you can pause this video to read the little parts. Basically it's going to tell you the same thing. Sodium ions are trying to rush in they make the potassium ions less negative or even positive and as a result of this the charge has changed it's become depolarized and it allows the firing of an action potential that will continue to travel through uh, the axon the terminal branches and then eventually helping to release a neurotransmitter and uh, finally we need to discuss exactly how multiple neurons will interact and so as I mentioned earlier there's a very small gap between where your neurons are going to interact or almost uh, connect. And so if you look at this picture, what you're seeing is uh, the top section with all the little basically bubbles with red dots. This is a terminal button. Inside of that terminal button, there are synoptic vesicles. And uh, the synaptic vesicles are uh, the bubble-like substances that you see. And what those do is they hold specific neurotransmitters. So you may have a synaptic vesicle that holds um, acetylcholine or norepinephrine or dopamine. And so the purpose of that is basically to get pushed out the end of the terminal button and then release those neurotransmitters. They're trying to cross this gap that you see that's called the synaptic cleft. And in crossing this gap the goal is basically to bond 
or attach itself to a receptor site. And so in this diagram, you have really two neurons. You're going to have one, the postsynaptic neuron, which is trying to receive those neurotransmitters. In this picture, it's highlighted by the purple circle with the little red dot in the middle. That's the postsynaptic neuron. It is trying to receive the message. The presynaptic neuron is the one uh, on the top, and it's holding basically the synaptic vesicles. It's got all the neurotransmitters. That's part of the terminal button that you see on the diagram. So the presynaptic is the sender. The postsynaptic is the receiver. Uh, receptor sites. So you're going to have different types of receptor sites. Basically think of it like a lock and a specific key that's trying to open up that lock. So I might have a key that I could put in your lock, but it might not be the right key. And so the same thing happens at receptor sites. You have specific receptor sites for different neurotransmitters. And so sometimes you may be releasing neurotransmitters that can't actually bond at those receptor sites. So what happens to those things? Uh, there's a few options. One of them is that if there's too much, if say a lot of neurotransmitters are being released, but the receptor sites are wrong or they're being blocked by some other substance, then those neurotransmitters or those chemical messages, they have to be uh, dissolved and so through the process of basically different protein enzymes that hang out here, they can actually break down some of those neurotransmitters or those neurotransmitters can be uh, part of a process called reuptake where they're basically going to be reabsorbed back into the terminal button into a new synaptic, uh, synaptic vesicle and when this happens basically they're saved for later. So if you have a neuron that is building up what we call a PSP, this is the postsynaptic uh, potential, there is a neuron that is building up more of a chance to release the, uh, the action potential and fire a message and help release chemical messages. That's called a, the excitatory PSP. So it's trying to basically boost the chance of it releasing. But if there is the inhibitory version of the PSP, then it's actually blocking it, like a break. It's trying to basically stop it from happening. Um, and then finally, the last thing here that I haven't described, synaptic pruning. This is basically a process that your brain will engage in. And the goal of this is basically to help your brain reduce less used neuron, uh, neural networks. And so you're making lots of connections to do small things like bat an eyelash or blink your eyes. And so over time, you're going to actually start to have connections that are no longer really used. You've developed better connections, faster connections. And so some of those older networks that are less used, they're going to actually be removed to make space for the new ones. And so that is what synaptic pruning is. Um, so that pretty much is going to conclude the basic structure of the neuron and how the communication works. Again, this is a very vocab heavy unit, so it's definitely important to come back to this uh, and hit the vocab hard. Um, it gets much easier if you focus and you are studying the words. Otherwise, it's going to seem like a lot of stuff if you just check it out one time and don't come back to it. So keep that in mind as you're moving through this unit. It's you know some people's favorite stuff, learning about the brain, and some people dread this one because it is so vocab heavy. So uh, you'll have to be the judge of that at the end of it, but I uh, hope as well. That's going to conclude this uh, first video in the biology unit. Hopefully you'll stick around for more.